Uh, I believe the children can be dismissed for junior church. So the scripture reading for today is, is in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing against, uh, pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we were hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say, and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them, and then came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boat to land, they left everything and followed him. You may be seated. There's a story about a group of Turkish soldiers in Palestine during World War I who needed to scatter a flock of sheep I don't know if it was malicious or if it, they were in the way, but they waded into this group of sheep and started waving their arms and yelling at them to scatter into the forest. And of course they did, their sheep. And somewhere in the middle of all that chaos, their shepherd that was up on the hillside realized what was happening and let out the, the call that only those sheep knew. And at the first call, as it echoed across the valley, the sheep mostly stopped as they heard it. And then he did it a second time. And in unison, all of the sheep just started to sweep up into the hillside where the shepherd was to follow the voice of their shepherd. The sheep had been trained to listen for that call. And when you hear a story like that, or you've probably seen a, a video of animals that have been trained, whether it's sheep or dogs it's pretty amazing that they can be trained to do something like that in our text this morning jesus is calling his disciples to himself it's the first time that we see it here in the gospel of luke and of course you know that when it comes to an animal like a sheep or a dog they get trained right they it, over a repeated uh, amount of times, they get either oh, some kind of a reward or punishment, and eventually they learn to follow the voice of their master. But how do humans learn to listen? How does Jesus call people, and what is it that makes them respond? In verse 11, at the end of our text that was just read for us, Peter and these other fishermen walk away from everything in order to follow Jesus. And at the beginning of the text, they're just casual observers. In fact, it seems like it's just a coincidence that they happened to be there that day. Um, they just got done uh, fishing, and they're sitting there washing their nets while Jesus starts teaching next to them. Maybe they're kind of overhearing his sermon. So it kind of just seems like a, an accident at first. 
But by the end, they're walking away from the biggest catch of fish that they've ever caught. They're walking away from their family business, what they've done their whole life, to follow this Jesus. So how did that happen? What is it that they discover or that they see about our Savior that make them willing to walk away from everything? In chapter 4, we just saw the people of Nazareth, they, Jesus' hometown, they try to kill Jesus. Then he goes over to Capernaum, and they want him to stay there, but he doesn't stay there. He keeps going. But here in Luke chapter 5, there's a group of people that are going to stay with Jesus. After this, Peter and James and John are going to be with Jesus, and Jesus is going to be with them. And here we are today, 2,000 years later, and we are a group of Jesus followers, Jesus disciples, a group of people that have found something in Christ that is worth following. So Luke is going to show us here how to become a follower of Jesus. And of course, that matters for us here this morning because we want to make sure that we're followers of Jesus. A lot of people have wrong ideas about what it means to be a follower of Jesus and what that looks like. Some people today think that just saying you're a follower of Jesus is all you have to do. Some people today think, well, there's certain things you just have to do. There's kind of certain things you have to know, and then you're a follower of Jesus. But in these verses, Luke is going to show us what it means to become a follower of Jesus. And more than that, we see in these verses that Peter and these other men found a Jesus that was worth following. He was worth leaving everything for. They didn't decide to follow Jesus because they didn't have anything else to do. These guys weren't just sitting around, kind of bored, maybe kind of lazy, and then Jesus comes along and says, why don't you follow me? And they're like, well, we're not doing anything else. And they don't find in Christ someone who is worth following part-time. You know, like when they get a chance in between fishing trips from here on out, they'll go check out this Jesus and how he's doing and what's going on with him. This is going to be a a life-changing, a full-time commitment that these men find in Christ. So, we're going to see in this text that Jesus is worth following. And it's worth asking yourself this morning, are you following him? So, first of all, notice in these verses that Jesus is worth obeying. Jesus is worth obeying. The scene begins with another typical kind of crowd that is listening to Jesus teach. This time it's not in the synagogue, it's actually in the Sea of Galilee. And uh, Luke calls it here the the Lake of Gennesaret, um, which was just the name for the northwestern tip of the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee, it's called the Sea of Galilee, but it is actually just a lake. It's 13 miles long by 7 miles at its widest point. Um, It was pretty close to Capernaum, where Jesus had just been teaching. Obviously, Jesus' reputation has been growing. There's a massive crowd of people that come to hear Jesus speak this day. Um, Probably it was too many to fit in the synagogue. And it actually ends up being too many for even for Jesus to sit on the the shore and and teach them. Um, You can imagine in a large crowd of people, um, they get all close. You can't really project and get real loud if someone's right here in your face. So there's kind of an an acoustics problem because of the size of the crowd. So Jesus um, sees Simon Peter and the other disciples, will be soon disciples, um, there by the side of the the lake. And he asks them to, to take their boats, just go out a little bit from the shore so Jesus can sit down. That's how teachers would teach in that time. They wouldn't stand up. And they, um, he teaches the crowd from their boat. So it all just seems like a random chance encounter at this point. It seems like it's just another day of Jesus' teaching. But something else is going on. Jesus has something bigger that he wants to do today than even just speaking to this crowd. Because after the sermon is over and the crowd is going away, Jesus turns to Simon and says to him, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, if any other human had suggested it, this it would have been absolutely crazy you remember jesus is not a fisherman Um, jesus was a carpenter by trade and now he's a teacher and everyone was coming to hear him teach 
But fishing is not Jesus' area of expertise. And Peter tells him, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. Peter says, we've been here all night. These boats would have been probably 20 to 30 feet long. You would toss nets off the side of them and you would go fishing at night for two reasons. One reason was is that at night it was cooler and so the fish would come closer to the surface. And also when it was dark out, the fish couldn't see the nets. Um, and so it makes sense to go fishing at night and that's what they'd been doing and they'd caught absolutely nothing. So by every human reason and human understanding, it made absolutely no sense to go back into the water. One, they were tired, they were frustrated, they'd been out all night. It all, they also just got done washing these nets. And so Jesus is telling them, basically start this whole process over again. I want you to put out into the, where the water's a little deeper and put your net down to fish. And Peter's response to this is surprising because he says, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. Now, I don't know if this is from growing up in Sunday school or whatever else, but a lot of times I used to kind of read this passage and think, Peter was kind of doing it reluctantly, and, and maybe he was reluctant to a certain standpoint where he didn't understand what was, what, why Jesus was asking him to do this. But notice the obedience of Peter in this passage. Peter displays an attitude of submission to Christ. He says, this makes absolutely no human sense, but I'm going to do as you say and put down the nets. You could imagine somebody coming into your workplace and telling you how to do your job. Where, whatever kind of job you have, wherever you work, whether you work at home, you work in an office, you work on a job site, imagine somebody showing up there with no background at your job and saying to you, oh, actually, you know what you need to do right here? Uh, just click on that, do this, do, you know. Well, what are you doing? You don't, you don't know my job, right? This wasn't Peter, James, and John's first time out on the, on the Sea of Galilee. Right? They've been fishing on this, uh, on this sea, probably, on this big, huge lake, probably their whole life. They, they knew what they were supposed to be doing. And Jesus says, go out, put your nets down. And Peter's reaction is, okay, I'll do it. There must have been, the text doesn't tell us, but Peter saw something and knew something of Christ that made him obey Jesus. Looking at it from a human perspective, it made absolutely no sense. But looking at Jesus, the only right response here was obedience. Following Jesus means that you believe that Jesus is worth obeying. Obedience is not just doing what Jesus says when it makes sense to us. Obedience is not just doing what Jesus says when we feel like it. There's a story that illustrates this that a, a seminary professor told one time that a kid knocked on his door and wanted him to come out and play with him with his new wiffle ball bat that he had just gotten. A neighborhood kid and, you know, he didn't have anybody else to play with, so he really wanted to try it out. So the guy said, sure, and he stepped outside and the kid gave him the wiffle ball and marked off a few paces and the, the guy tossed the ball to him and the kid swung with all of his might, missed by a foot. So the kid got a little frustrated, and they retrieved the ball, set all back up again. The seminary professor tossed him the ball again. He missed again. So then the kid really started to get frustrated, and they said, well, they'll try one more time. And the seminary professor tossed it to him. He swung, missed again, again, by a mile. And the kid got super frustrated and said, you're not doing it right. And uh, the guy said, well, what do you mean I'm not doing it right? And he said, you're supposed to pitch it where I'm swinging. <laughs> right? And that's, that's, sometimes that's kind of our attitude towards the Lord, right? The Lord is supposed to adjust to what we're doing, right? God is supposed to adjust to what I want and what I feel. And when God doesn't do that, we kind of start to get upset. Like, what, what's, the Lord, what's the Lord doing here? He, he must be messing up somehow. But notice here that it wasn't Jesus that needed to adjust to Peter. It was Peter that needed to obey the Lord. You can be sure that Peter didn't feel like putting those nets down. Peter didn't understand the reasons why he needed to put the nets down. 
But Peter believes that there's something about Jesus that's worth obeying. Even when he doesn't understand it, even when he doesn't feel it. You know, it always surprises me how often you can talk to somebody who says they follow Jesus, but then when some area or issue of obedience comes up, they say, oh, I don't do that. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll mention something to somebody that, about something that Jesus has clearly commanded, something about how we maybe spend our money or how we're supposed to love other Christians or something about what the Bible says about marriage, and people just say, oh, no, I don't believe that. That's not right. Well, that's, that's not what the mark of a follower of Jesus is. Followers of Jesus obey Jesus. Obeying Jesus isn't optional. Um, if, in John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So here, as Luke gives us the account of the very first followers of Jesus, what do we find? We find people who obey Jesus. Followers of Jesus are characterized, are marked by obedience. If you're a follower of Jesus, then obeying Jesus is a big deal to you. And if you're here this morning, you kind of are thinking, you know, sometimes I obey Jesus, but, you know, there's some kind of, sometimes I don't, whatever, you know, kind of either way. Or if you have areas in your life that you know are disobedient to Jesus, then you have to start to question, are you really following him? Now, if you're following Jesus, we all know that we don't do it perfectly. We're not perfectly obedient, but obedience is a priority for us. We want to obey Jesus. We don't just accept casually areas when we find areas of disobedience in our life. Those, those horrify us, and we ask for God's forgiveness, and, and we make that, that diligent effort to keep obeying him and keep following him. And notice here that and the flesh and our flesh and the devil always want to make obedience look pointless and want to make it look too hard, right? Just like Peter could have said, what's the point of this? And also, this is going to be actually really hard. Um, this is going to be a whole lot of extra work that I didn't want to do. And that's, that's how obedience is always presented to us by the world, by the flesh, by, by the devil. Ah, this is too hard. This is impossible. You can't really do it. But in truth, what is obedience? Obedience is the pathway to a greater blessing. The text has already been read to us. A lot of us already know this story. What's about to happen? What does Peter get as a reward for his obedience? Obedience is always the pathway to seeing more of Jesus and seeing more of the blessing of Jesus. So obedience is not something that we take casually or half-heartedly. A follower of Jesus believes that Jesus is worth obeying. And second, I want you to see in the text that Jesus is worth worshiping. Obedience is just a part. It's just the beginning of starting to see what it means to follow Jesus. Now, Jesus isn't a fisherman, but Jesus can tell fish where to go, and he knows exactly where they're going to be. Because Jesus, as God, is all-powerful and all-knowing. So what's the next thing that happens after they put the nets down? And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partner in the other boat for them to come and help them, and they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. And Peter, here is, Peter's always the spokesman, kind of, for all the disciples. So he, speaking for all of them, has the right response. Simon Peter sees this catch of fish, and he falls down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. At first, Peter's response might kind of puzzle you, right? Because it wasn't, there wasn't anything about Peter's sin that was really in view here, right? And Peter actually says to Jesus, Depart from me, which kind of seems like a strange thing to say, right? But it wasn't the presence of the fish that Peter was concerned about. It was the fact that he realized that he was in the presence of God. The only one who could make hundreds of fish swim into a net all at once in the middle of the day is the person who made the fish and who made the lake that they were on top of. What did Peter see about Jesus in this moment? 
What made him fall in worship at Jesus' feet? Well, Peter saw the abundant greatness of Jesus. Jesus didn't have just a few fish swim into the net. That would have been actually pretty surprising. Jesus didn't have just an average catch of fish swim into this net. That would have been amazing. Instead, Jesus has an incredible number of fish swim into this net. An incredible number of fish that only an incredible God could send. It's a, it's a net-ripping, boat-sinking catch of fish. And suddenly, Peter realizes that he is in the presence of a great God. And not just a great God, a good God. What does Jesus use here to display his greatness? I mean, think of all of the amazing things that Jesus had available to him, right? Jesus could have used thunderbolts and lightning. Um, Jesus could have used, um, you know, some kind of flying, lifting the boat up out of the ocean, right? A lot of things that could have scared Peter that could have really horrified him. But what does Jesus choose to use? He uses something that's good, a whole bunch of fish, the biggest catch of fish that they'd ever gotten, more fish than they could have imagined, the biggest haul they've ever brought in. And in the middle of pulling in this massive load of fish with his boat sinking, Peter suddenly realizes that he is in the presence of the good and great God of the universe. Everything fades into the background now. And Peter's words are, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Peter, at this moment, actually has a right view of himself. You can never have a right view of yourself until you have a right view of God. And that's why Peter's response here, if you think about it, actually isn't that surprising. Because it's actually the same response that everyone else in Scripture has when they are in the presence of God. Um, you think about John in Revelation chapter 1. He sees the exalted, risen Christ, and he says that he falls at his feet like a dead man. Moses meets God at the burning bush, and he takes his shoes off. Um, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, is um, in the presence of God, and at the very first thing that he realizes is his own sense of his unworthiness and his sinfulness. Here, Peter asked Jesus to depart from him. Um, and it was Isaiah who realized that he was, had unclean lips. His first words out of his mouth are, Woe is me, for I am undone. Peter says to Jesus, Depart from me. It's obviously not a literal re request, but it's, it's an understanding that Peter suddenly saw his own unworthiness. I guess maybe the best way that I can describe it, if I, I don't think this is without being too casual with it, but if you ever see a, a, a video maybe of somebody making like a crazy trick shot on a basketball court, maybe out on the street somewhere or maybe in a gym and somebody makes this incredible shot, and, and the very first reaction of everybody who's watching that is they run, they scatter, right? Because it's so amazing and mind-blowing that they're just freaking out, right? Um, if you've ever seen videos of like a street ma magician that will do something out on the street and he does something that just totally blows everyone's minds. They have no idea how he just did it. Inevitably, there'll be somebody in the crowd that just starts running, right? Because they are in the presence of something that is unexplainable. It, it's, it's something that's bigger than they are. And as human beings, we struggle to be in the presence of something that is truly great. Something that is truly overwhelming us. And I think that's what's happening here with Peter when he asks Jesus to depart from him. Jesus says, or Peter says to Jesus, what am I doing here? How could I be in your presence? Just like everyone else that realizes that they are in the presence of God. Even the prodigal son who's attracted by the abundant goodness of his father says, I'm not worthy 
to be called your son anymore. So now, suddenly, in the presence of this great goodness, Peter sees himself correctly as a sinner. He sees the, the impossibility, the holiness of who he is sitting in front of. I recently ran across a, a story of a, a man who was saved under the ministry of uh, Francis Schaeffer. If you don't know who Francis Schaeffer is, he was a, a famous uh, theologian and apologist, especially in our, in our country in the 60s and 70s. And um, this man was saved underneath his ministry in his early 20s. And as soon as he got saved, um, he started witnessing to his dad. His dad was a, a, a dogmatic atheist and didn't want to really hear the gospel. But he was a nice man. He had a good relationship with his dad. Um, but his dad, every single time they brought up anything about God or the gospel, they had a nice kind of civil, polite conversation. But his dad didn't, didn't really want to hear it. And so um, it came time to uh, when his dad got really sick. And uh, he was actually on, in the hospital on his deathbed. And this guy thought, well, I'm going to try to go witness to my dad one last time. And uh, he brought Francis Schaefer with him to share the gospel with him. And so um, Dr. Schaefer sat there and explained to this man one more time what it meant to be forgiven, um, that, that he was a sinner, um, but that Jesus had loved him and had died on the cross for his sins. And this man's eyes started to be open. And he looked at Dr. Schaefer and he said, how could a worm accept all that? And Dr. Schaefer looked at this man on the hospital bed and said, how could a worm refuse? And that man came to know Christ that day. And that man was in the same exact place that Peter is in our text, where he is starting to realize the greatness of Christ and at the same time how little he is. A follower of Christ is someone who believes that Jesus is worth worshiping. Right here from the beginning, here's Peter deciding to follow Jesus. And what does he do? He's at Jesus' feet in awe. And I, I just want to ask every single one of you here this morning, have you ever had an encounter with Jesus like this? Have you ever sat at Jesus' feet with a sense of awe at his greatness and his goodness and wonder how he could love you, a sinner condemned unclean, as the hymn goes. Have you ever... We don't have to see a miracle to have an, an awe-filled response of Christ. We just have to see the one who does miracles, this Jesus... Have you ever had an encounter with Jesus where you realized that he wasn't just adequate or okay or barely enough, but you realized that he was abundantly good, like extravagantly good, over-the-top amazing? Have you ever had an encounter with Christ like that? Because if Jesus is just some dry, boring thing to you, then you kind of just have to stop for a second and ask, am I really a follower of Jesus? Right? Like if Jesus is just like, yeah, you know, he's okay. I've heard about him. I know about him. I know some of these things about him. If that's it, you got to stop for a second and ask yourself, am I really a follower of Christ? Because followers of Christ worship Christ. You can be like the crowd that heard Jesus speak that day and, oh, that was nice, and then go away. But the disciples are always the ones who, like, hang around afterwards, right? They're the ones who want to know more about Jesus. They want to see something more of him. Not just to hear a nice sermon and go home and say, hey, I heard this sermon today, but to actually get to know Christ, to see Christ for themselves like Peter does here in the middle of this boat that's now filled with fish. This is a, a worship that changes how you view yourself, right? 
Notice again that Peter wasn't caught in any specific sin. Peter didn't have Jesus walk in on him while he was yelling at his kids or while he was stealing something, and then, oh man, I got caught by Jesus, I was sinning. But Peter realized that he was in the presence of a holy Christ. He was in the presence of a Jesus who was abundantly good and abundantly great. And in that moment, he realized, wait a second, what am I doing here? Right? So the first response, if you're in the presence of God, is just worship. Just fall on your face. But the very next thought is, who, me? Jesus wants something to do with me? Right? Because Peter realizes here that what he's seeing is special. Jesus didn't choose to let everybody see this miracle. There was millions of people that were alive, and they didn't get to see this. But, but Peter realizes not just that Jesus is good and great, but that this goodness and this greatness is directed towards him, that he is getting to see it. So have you ever seen something of Jesus, something about his goodness, something about his greatness, that actually directed you to the thought, how could he love me this much? How, how could he direct this towards me? Followers of Jesus worship Jesus. If you have no interest in worshiping Christ, if you haven't found anything worthy or valuable in him, then you can't call yourself a follower of Jesus. But if you're here this morning and God is working in your heart and you are sitting there thinking, I want to encounter Jesus like that. I want to see something about Jesus that fills me with awe, then that's the first step, right? That's God working in your heart and opening up your eyes to see the worthiness of Christ, to see that he is worth worshiping. But if you want to encounter Christ, when he was here on earth, you needed to go be in his physical presence. If you want to encounter Christ today, you do it through his word. And if you want to, if you want to see Jesus like this, if you want to see something about the greatness of Jesus and the goodness of Jesus, you're going to see it in your Bible. So that means you have to get alone with your Bible in uninterrupted, unhurried time so that you can see something of the goodness or the greatness of Jesus. It really, you could look at your time with the Lord this way, where you open up your Bible and you are literally saying, Lord, just show me one thing about Jesus today. And you read as long as it takes to see one thing about Jesus that you can worship him for. You can read, you can do Bible reading plans, that's good. You can read other good devotional booklets, that's all good too. But what you really need to do is see something about Jesus that your soul feeds on. Something about his greatness, something about his goodness that sends you to your knees in worship to him. That's what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. Followers of Jesus worship Jesus. Followers of Jesus obey Jesus. And lastly, I want you to see here in our text that followers of Jesus are reshaped by Jesus. Because Jesus isn't done here, right? The, the, the story doesn't end here. There's, there's some, something else is going to happen. Because now Jesus is going to give them a whole new purpose for their lives. He says to Peter, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. The first thing that Jesus has to do is just reassure Peter that everything is going to be okay. And every single time that somebody encounters either an angel or that they do see God, there's always those first words that have to come out of their mouth just to let them know you're not about to be obliterated, right? That the, the fear and the, the awe that's filled your soul is, is not all that there is, that, that it's okay. Why? Because Jesus actually has a plan to use Peter. Because if you're really seeing the greatness of God and then you see your own sinfulness— the temptation is to be like, well, this is, this is kind of done, right? I'm, I'm so small. I've, I've got so much sin. What could Jesus ever do with me? 
right? All, all, I, I don't even understand what I'm doing here now with what I've already seen of Jesus. Is there anything else for me? But there is, right? Jesus is going to use Peter not to fish for fish anymore, but to fish for people, to share the gospel. Peter's life used to be all about one thing, getting fish, right? It was undoubtedly what he thought about. It was what he was focused on. It was what he spent his time on. It was how he provided for his family. Everything in Peter's life revolved around fishing. And what Jesus says to him is, you're, everything in your life is still going to revolve around fish, fishing. All that same energy, all that same dedication, all that same diligence, all that same hard work, it's still all going to get used. But it's not going to be used for the stuff in the, in the lake anymore, Peter. It's going to be used for sharing the gospel with people. That's the, the new plan. Jesus is going to reshape Peter. And of course, you read the rest of the Gospels, and Peter has a lot of ups and downs, right? Um, he's, a, he's a great character to read about in the Bible. But then what happens in Acts, the very beginning of the book, after Jesus has been resurrected and gone up to heaven, Peter gets up to preach a sermon, and all these fish run into the net, right? But it's not the, not the swimming kind of fish, the people fish. 3,000 people in one day are saved after one of Peter's sermons. Jesus had a plan to use Peter. And I think it's so encouraging that God chooses to use regular people like Peter. As we know, Jesus did not go around picking all of the wealthy celebrities and um, all of the politicians and all of the powerful people to be followers of him. Peter wasn't any of those things. Peter is just a regular guy. A regular guy out fishing who met Jesus. And he obeys Jesus, he worships Jesus, and now he gets sent by Jesus. So you can rightly say here that Jesus is the one who does all the fishing, right? I don't think that any of the disciples, you know, left that day and they're like, man, we're really good at fishing, right? But what does Jesus do? Jesus uses them, right? Jesus, if he wanted to, could have just lifted the fish up out of the lake and put it into the boat. But that's not how God works. It's not how Jesus works. God uses means, right? God uses ways of doing things. He can do it other ways if he wants to, but, but the way he works is he uses people, right? So here, he brought in this incredible catch of fish. And who brought it in? You could definitely say on one hand, it was all Jesus, well, you could also say those fishermen used their nets, their muscles, their energy, their boats to bring it in. And that's exactly how the gospel works, too. God has chosen you and me to be the ones that share the gospel with people. Now, he didn't have to do it that way. And, and, and God certainly can work and not use us. And sometimes that's how people are saved. But most of the time, when someone comes to know Christ, it's because somebody told them. Somebody shared the message with them. And what Jesus says to the disciples here is, if you want to sign up, you're interested in signing up and following me, let me tell you what it's going to look like. Here's the job description. The job description is, you're going to be a fisher of people. You're going to be the one that diligently, um, courageously, uh, tired, tirelessly shares the gospel with people. You put the gospel net down into the ocean and you wait for the, Jesus send the fish into the net. You're going to get a whole new identity, a whole new purpose for living your life. And that purpose, that job description is sharing the gospel. So the first question is, are you willing to let Jesus change the purpose of your life? Right? As we obey Jesus, as we worship Jesus, he's shaping us into something different. And isn't it true that every single time that you see somebody in the Bible that really sees God, the very next thing that he does is he sends them. Right? Moses sees, sees God at the burning bush, and he's sent to lead his people. Um, John sees Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, and then he's going to get the account of how everything is going to unfold at the end of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, and then Isaiah, of course, sees 
God in his throne room, and, and Isaiah is the one that raises his hand and says, Here am I, Lord, send me. I think a lot of the time we don't have a real sense of being sent by God because too often we haven't seen God. But just know that if you see him, if you're here this morning, and you have a sense of how abundant his goodness and his greatness is, his plan is not just to leave you there. His plan is to send you to tell other people about how great and good Jesus is. So what the disciples do here, they bring their boats to land, and they leave it all to follow him. Once you make the decision that Jesus is worth obeying and worth worshiping, then you're going to believe that he can reshape you. He can change you into something totally brand new. The things you used to focus on, the things you used to put your energy and talents into, Jesus is going to use that same energy and talents. But it's just not going to be directed towards the things that it used to be. It's going to be directed towards sharing the gospel with people. And of course, from the world standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. What in the world would you be doing, right? Why would you walk away from boats and from a business and from a whole bunch of fish that you just caught? I'm sure the people on the shore were thinking, these guys are nuts. And the world's going to look at us as we focus on sharing the gospel and think, man, what are these people doing? Why would you give up so much to share the gospel with people? That doesn't make any sense. But of course, we know that as followers of Jesus, that's what he's called us to do. That's, that's, it's, our, it's our calling. It's our identity. It, it's, that's who we are now, fishers of people. We we're, are we're the ones that have been sent by Jesus to spread his message. And again, I just think that based on this text, we have to be stunned by the number of people that claim to be followers of Jesus, but then never want to share anything about Jesus. We talk about movies and TV shows, we talk about sports, we talk about the weather, we talk about politics, we do it confidently, we do it boldly, we have no problem doing it. But then we have an opportunity to speak about our Savior, our Savior who has sent us to share Him with the world. And we're like, oh, well, you know, you don't really have anything to say. Whether it's informally, it could be at a, at a family gathering, it could just be you're on the phone with somebody that you know, it could be at work, it could be at a, one of our outreaches here that we have at the church. And we have opportunities to share the gospel. And we need to take those opportunities. We need to pray for those opportunities. We need to take advantage of those opportunities. We need to jump at those opportunities because that's what we're called to do. That's, that's what Jesus' followers do. Jesus' followers are, are fishermen. <laughs> are, we're, we're, fish, we're, we're out there to catch people, to tell them about the gospel. So maybe the, the biggest evidence that we haven't really encountered Jesus, that we haven't really seen something of the goodness and the greatness of Jesus for ourselves, is that we so rarely share anything about Jesus with the world around us. We, we know that we are, we, we say that we're followers, but, but we have forgotten this basic job description that we have. Jesus wants, and you, we all would say, I'm not comfortable sharing the gospel. It's hard. I don't know the right words. I'm not sure if I said it right. You know, I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. That's, that's, it is hard, right? It is uncomfortable. But Jesus is reshaping us, right? Jesus is giving us a new mission in life. And, and the mission in life that we have is to be sharing the gospel with the people around us. It was going to be very uncomfortable and costly for these disciples to follow Jesus, right? They were going to lose their business. Um, they, were, it, they were going to be in a lot of uncomfortable situations. And eventually all these men are going to lose their lives because they dedicate it to spreading the gospel of Jesus. But if Jesus has the power to send fish into nets, then he also has the power to send regular people out with a life-transforming message. So what kind of passion do you see in your life and in your heart for sharing the gospel? If you're a follower of Christ, telling people about Jesus should be a passion and a priority. It sh you should see it as one of the main things that a Jesus follower does. Right? It's one of the, the, the biggest things we do. 
Um, and I think, again, sometimes we have these, you know, idea, if you, I think if you ask somebody, what does a Jesus follower do? You know, I'll go to church, you know, um, maybe you're supposed to pray, and those are all good things, but if you read the New Testament, and you especially see what Jesus says a Jesus follower does, it's fish for people. Tell people about the gospel. There was a documentary that they released back in 2010 called Waiting for Superman. And one of the things that sticks out to me about that documentary is this one part in the, in the film where they talk about rubber rooms in New York City um, and for, for teachers. And in the, the public school system in New York City, when a teacher would be disciplined and or be in trouble for not doing their job or have some kind of an accusation, they wouldn't be allowed to teach anymore, but they still have to show up to work in order to get paid. So they, the, the, the school district in New York actually took an empty school building and made it for uh, these teachers who couldn't teach anymore, where, where they just had to show up to fulfill the obligations of their contract so that they could still get paid. And in the, in the documentary, they show you film of this of these teachers that show up and they have to be there for like whatever the hours are, you know, eight to five or nine to five or something like that. And they just have to sit in these rooms um, while they're waiting for their cases to be heard and while they're, you know, waiting for everything to get resolved with, with whatever happened. And they just have to sit in these rooms and do nothing. You know, they can bring a book or a newspaper to kind of occupy themselves. And there's teachers that will be, they call them rubber rooms. Um, they're basically like waiting rooms where they just show up and do nothing waiting for their cases to get resolved. And sometimes they're there for months. Sometimes some of them have even been doing that for years. And I'm not going to get into the whole point of the film, obviously. He's talking about public education and the systemic problems that cause something like that to happen that's that wasteful and ridiculous, right? But, but just one aspect of that that breaks your heart, right? The tragedy of that is you see people that are supposed to be teaching that aren't right? Teachers are supposed to teach, right? It's what a teacher does. And so when you look at that and you see somebody who's supposed to be a teacher and you see them just sitting in a room week after week, year after year, you're like, something's wrong with that. It's not supposed to be that way. And that just made me think that sometimes I think we get into a, a mentality or we somehow get the idea that as Christians, we can be in one of those rubber rooms, one of those waiting rooms, you know, that, that I'm not really doing all the stuff that a Jesus follower is supposed to do, but I'm still a follower of Jesus. But I would just say, you can read through your New Testament. There's nobody like that in the New Testament. There's no category for that. There's, there's no middle ground. There's no waiting room. There's no rubber room for Christians. If you're a follower of Jesus, obeying Jesus is a big deal. If you're a follower of Jesus, worshiping Jesus is a big deal. If you're a follower of Jesus, sharing Jesus is a big deal. That's what Jesus' followers do. That it, it's, it's, in, it's in our job description, it's in our DNA, it's our priority, it's our passion. So my question to you is, are you a follower of Jesus? That's what you have to sit there and, and think through the evidence in your life. And if you're not, this morning you can become a follower of Jesus. You can make the decision that Peter and these other men made there on, the, on the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee to leave everything behind and follow him because he's worth it, right? And if you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I just give us this simple reminder. He's worth it. He's worth obeying. He's worth worshiping. He's, he's worth sharing. So let's keep our eyes on him as we follow him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that shows us your son. Help us to, to see him more clearly. To, to get our own glimpse of him. His goodness and his greatness. Lord, I just ask that you would work in hearts, that you would work in our hearts, that we would follow you diligently and passionately, and that you would give us chances this week to obey Jesus, 
and worship Jesus and share Jesus. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody that's here this morning that that doesn't know him, that really isn't a follower of him, that this morning you would open up their eyes to see that, that they would repent of whatever it is they've been holding on to to keep them from following him, and that they would make that decision to, to begin to be his disciple, his follower this morning. So Lord, I, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.